<clears throat> well, we're here again, and uh, we're here in church, and we've got our Bibles in our hand, and, and uh, we're singing songs, and we're submitting to the authority of God's Word. Um, and I was thinking about this today, that it's like uh, another time, another Saturday that we're here, and, and then the next week, and the next week, and it's kind of a, a broken up into these little segments, if you will, you know? Um, but really it's not. I think you need to change, if you're like me, you have to change the way you think that it's, it's really a, uh, a cumulative thing. It's a, it's a group thing. It's, it's not just that you came this week. I'm glad that you did, but it's not that you just came this week and what does God have for me this week? And it's really a big thing. There's a, there's a process. There's something that's, that's, um, that's being done, that God has a plan and He's working on something uh, to, to accomplish a goal and a task. And, and that's why you're here. It's not just that you came and, and good job and you got the check mark and you fought off all the other temptations to do other things. And that's great, but, but, but you're here in process of doing something. God is trying to uh, accomplish something. Uh, the scriptures say, if you could bring up that first verse, I want to show you what the Bible says is happening. You're here to do that. You're here because Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and all the power of hell will not conquer it. That he is trying to accomplish something here in you. He's trying to grow the kingdom and expand the kingdom so it includes more people because a, a king's glory is a growing population. Amen? But he's also trying to grow you. And so what Wilma said is true. He's taking this weak vessel with this amazing, perfect word, and he's trying to deepen his relationship with you so you can be equipped and ready and full of power to go and spread the kingdom of God. So he's trying to build it in, 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 in size this way and also this way. Right now, it's this way. Here we are. So we're going to do this, and then some of us, if not all of us, are going to go do that. So we're going vertical, and then we're going horizontal. That's what he wants to do. Now, how does Jesus accomplish this task? I'll show you what he does. Bring up the next one. That's how he does it. He says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. Now, of course, this is a reference to Jesus being put on the cross and literally being lifted up onto the cross. And when he did, that started the process for this whole thing that we're sitting in right now. That started the whole thing. When he went up to the cross, Christianity began and wham, it, it, it spread across the world. But that same verse right there pertains to right now. Because as we... Lift up Jesus as we submit ourselves to his authority, his word. We praise him. We, we, we talk to him. We listen to him. We sing about him. We sing to him. We learn from him. We acknowledge his power and his preeminence. Then we're lifting him up. And when we do that, what happens? What does he do? Come on, we need some fire. He draws people to him, right? That's what we're here for. That's what we gather for, to lift up the name of Jesus and so that all people will be drawn to him. And that's what I'd like to do through the study of the Gospel of Luke. This Gospel of Luke is going to take us, I would assume, at least a year to get through. There's so much in there. So much in there. It's awesome. Do you know you could read the Gospel of Luke in about 30 minutes? I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm going to throw it out there. Tonight's the night for being bold, Wilma, right? I'm challenging you all to read the Gospel of Luke one time every day for the next year. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Would you give God 20 minutes of your life and see what he will do with that? We're going to study through the Gospel of Luke. No doubt this Jesus was the most popular, influential, controversial man to ever walk the face of the earth. It was Jesus Christ. He, he, he did things that, that, that nobody else has ever done. You know, he was on a boat one time, and there was a storm, and he told the storm to stop storming, and the storm stopped storming. 
And the people were freaked out. And like, who is this guy? Even the wind and waves, they obey this guy. Who is he? He made claims never heard before. You know, he, was, he went first to the Jews, and the Jews, like myself, we always, I believed in God, right? I believe in God. It was this unseen God, this, this father, this, this unseen spirit thing, spirit in the sky. <clears throat> and Jesus, Jesus said, yeah, you guys all believe in him? Well, that thing that you believe in and me, we're the same. We're one. And he said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Like, who's ever made a claim like that before? Nobody. He taught like nobody ever had. In Mark 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 22, it said the people were amazed because he taught with, with a greater authority than the teachers of religious law that had the, the Bible memorized. Who likes doing public speaking in school? Yeah. One person. Two. <clears throat> when, you, when you don't know what you're talking about, that'll make you nervous, won't it? But if you're well studied, if you've got that stuff memorized, you, you can step up here with some sort of boldness, right? If, if you're really familiar with the material that you've got, you can step up and be bold. The religious leaders had this material memorized. And the people were amazed because Jesus could speak with greater authority than the people who had it memorized. You know, if you had the, the stuff memorized, you could speak with authority. But when you're the author, come on. That's a whole new level, right? And that's what was going on here with these people. See, you... you the whole point of this study is you've you got to make a decision about Jesus. You've got to know who he is and make a decision about him. When, some, when that time came, when I got led to the Lord, when it finally happened, the guy comes up to me and says, you need to make a decision on Jesus. Don't, don't just brush him off. Don't, don't just throw, sweep it under the rug. Don't just include him as another one of the great people in the world, but not the greatest. He said, he said Moses, do you have kids? I said, yes. He said, um, so if you went to orientation... And, and the teacher said, um, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Mr. Johnson, and I'm God. What would you do? I'm like, I don't know. He goes, let me give you some options. You said you had kids, so if you went to the, to the school and some guy claimed that he was God, well, maybe he was a liar. Well, if he's a liar, Moses, would you, let him, would you let your kid go to his class? And I'm like, well, at that time, I probably used a different word than, oh, no. <clears throat> I always thought that God was that Jesus was a good teacher. Well, here's Mr. Johnson who says he's God, but he's not really God. He's a liar. I'm not gonna let my kid go to that class. Well, maybe he's just crazy. Maybe he's delusional. Maybe he thinks he's God, but he's really not. What would you do then? Again, probably expletive. No. He said, or your third choice is that he is, and you better bow. See, you've got to make a decision on Jesus. You've got to make a decision on Jesus. <clears throat> millions and millions of churches have been planted worldwide because of this Jesus. Wars have been fought because of this Jesus. People have been martyred by the thousands because of this Jesus. The greatest selling book of all time by leaps and bounds. I don't even know. They can't, there's just no record of how many of these things have been printed and, and, and distributed across the earth because there's too many. It, it beats all of the books by millions and millions and millions of copies. It must have some type of significance. And it's all because of this man, Jesus Christ. And we all have these false impressions about Jesus. Everybody does. I do. I learned some things as I'm studying Luke. Luke decided he was going to investigate and find out some truth and share it with some people. We need that because just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true, right? So we, we need some personal accounts. We need eyewitness accounts to clarify some things and cut through some half-truths and speculations. We need to know who Jesus Christ really is. 
We need to know who he is, what he really taught, what he really did, so we can make a, a sound choice. You know why it's imperative that we know this? Because the Bible tells us, Jesus Christ tells us in the Bible, John 4, 24 said that God is spirit, and so therefore those who worship him must, say must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he wants us to worship him in spirit. He wants it to, to hit our soul. And so we get excited about him and we'll clap and we'll yell and we'll scream and we'll dance and sometimes we cry. We, we get all excited and emotional. It should hit our feelings and it should hit our emotions. Jessica shared with us today in prayer that God gave us our emotions. No, don't necessarily be led by them, but, but use them to worship God. Right? So, so that's the spirit. Like, it should stir you up. But listen, don't laugh and don't clap and don't dance and don't shout and don't sing to something that's not real. And that's why it's get your emotions involved, but do it in truth. In truth. You need to know who God really is before you release your emotions to some false deity that you've conjured up in your mind or, or someone told you about. Hearsay. I'll tell you what, I'm not basing my 80 years or so here on earth or eternity. Do you, I can't even fathom how many years eternity is. I'm not basing my eternity on, on something that, that someone told me. I, I hear, I hope, I'm told, I think. I want to know. I want to know the truth. And, and so that's, that's what's happening here in, in the Gospel of Luke. I want you to read this, this book, but I'm going to read this just opening paragraph to you. You there? Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. These are the people that were really there. Eyewitnesses. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Theophilus, this man, we don't know a whole lot about him, but he was living while this Jesus stuff was going on. Not like now, 2,000 years later, where we have to rely on 2,000-year-old on, on text. This, this, guy, this book here was written like 30 years after Jesus ascended. This is like right then. He was living during all the craziness of all this. Chaos. Insanity. Crazy crowds. Some people loved Jesus. Some people hated Jesus. Some worshipped him. Some, some wanted to kill him. Some did. But let me tell you something. He stirs people up, doesn't he? Jesus stirs people up. You can talk about God all day long. But don't you dare talk about Jesus Christ. Because people get fired. Don't shove your religion down my throat. You talk about anything but you do not talk about Jesus. But, 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 but listen, Theophilus was living during this time of craziness, so he probably had heard some things, right? He probably heard some stuff about all that had happened with Jesus Christ. All the miracles and the crowds and the crucifixion and all this crazy stuff, walking on water and feeding 5,000 people and healing lepers and healing deaf people and paralyzed people and, 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 the, and the soldiers wanting to kill him. And I mean, just crazy stuff. Massive crowds gathered around this little Jewish carpenter from Nowhereville. He had heard a lot of stuff. And Luke, who historically is believed to be a doctor, and this doctor is taking time out for and referring to Theophilus as most honorable. And so the most likely conclusion is that Theophilus is a man, some type of man of influence. It's also true that Theophilus is a Gentile name. It's not a Hebrew name. This is just some foundational stuff about the gospel. I, want you, I need to get this through to you. Theophilus is not a Jewish guy. 
Theophilus is a Gentile. And so all this stuff is extremely foreign to him. All this crazy stuff that was going on in his world was crazy and foreign to him. And so Luke, a doctor, a man of great resource and great influence himself, great education, very learned man, he takes time out of his life to do some amazing research. It's a big deal, right? A big research paper. Anyone ever do any research papers in high school or college? And when I first started college, I got the first stuff was multiple choice and true and false. But when you start getting closer to the end, right, you have to start writing papers. And it's a lot of work and it's a lot of time. And this guy, Luke, he's taking a lot of time and he's putting in a lot of work to write to this guy. Do you know Luke also wrote the book of Acts to this guy? I don't know who this guy is, but he's obviously pretty special. He's very, very special. Do you know that these two books, when you combine the total length of both of these books, they're the single largest contribution to the New Testament by one author. More words than even Paul himself. This man, Luke, wrote. And he wrote it to one man, Theophilus. See, I think that what you quoted a moment ago, I was, I was going to quote this. I'm going to quote it again anyway. You all need to hear it. But I honestly think that Luke, I think he, he, he quotes something in Acts that you, you guys quoted. It's in, it's in Acts 1.8. He says, you, my disciples, will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, he understood the, this end of the earth mentality. He understood that this, this gospel message needed to reach the end of the earth. And, and, and for this message to reach the end of the earth, for it to be effective, it required that people of influence, people of audience, people of credibility, people of influence need to know the truth of the gospel so they can influence other people. And so he took the time and the, all the resources involved to write this massive two edition letter, Luke and Acts, to this one guy so that the gospel could literally reach the ends of the earth. It started in Jerusalem. That's what it said, right? You'll be my witness in Jerusalem. So the Jews get it. But how does it get to the ends of the earth unless some influential Gentiles hear the good news? And so he's relaying the message of the gospel to this Gentile so that that gospel can reach where he has an area of influence. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. But you also need to know that when he says you will be my witnesses, don't take that lightly. When you're going to be Jesus' witness, then you need to preach the real Jesus. If you're preaching some false gospel, then you ain't Jesus' witness. You might be, what's her name over there? You might be Guadalupe's witness, but you ain't Jesus' witness unless you know the truth. Jesus Christ himself said, I am the truth. I am the truth. You need to know him. You, you don't need to pass on some speculation Jesus, some hearsay Jesus, some gossip Jesus, some assumed Jesus, in my opinion, Jesus. We need to know the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And too many Christians are, are basing their opinion and their relationship with God for, for now and eternity on what other people say, not on truth gathered by personal pursuit. One of my favorite pastors of all time is a man named A.W. Tozer. And A.W. Tozer said that what comes into your mind when you think of God is the most important thing about you. Think about that. Whatever pops into your mind when you think of God is the single most important thing about you. And so if that is true, if it's true, isn't it imperative that you know the truth of who Jesus Christ is? And that's why we have the Word of God. And that's why we study it here at this church. There's a scary text in the Scriptures, and it's in Matthew 7. I'm going to read it to you. And I think it echoes exactly 
what Tozer was trying to get across here. And I think it probably, this is just me, this is, this is just conjecture, it's not the Bible. I think this verse, these verses I'm about to read to you, is the reason why, God, why Tozer wrote that quote. In, in Matthew uh, chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, <laughs> it says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That should frighten you. That should frighten you. That's something to think about. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will, in, will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, perform many miracles in your name. You can, uh, let's just call it, I did lots of stuff in your name. Whatever it may be, whatever your thing is, whatever your shtick is in your name. But Jesus will reply, I never knew you. What enters your mind when you think of God is the most important thing about you. You need to know who Jesus Christ is. You need to know Him. To know Him is to know life eternal. You need to know Him. And Luke realized that, and that's why he wrote this book. And so when you look back at the text there in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, he says, I'm writing this so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. See, he had heard lots of things about Jesus, the legend of Jesus. He had heard lots of stuff, but, but you need to know the truth of everything. So here's your pile of stuff you heard, and you need to know if, what's true and what's not in this pile so you can throw the rest out. And so he writes this book so he can understand the truth of Jesus Christ. We can take the claim that we have been heard, that we've heard, that someone passed on to us, or we saw it on the internet, or we saw it on TV, that we saw it because a preacher on television or the preacher in your church said it, and you take the claim and you measure it up to Scripture. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. So for us, here at Revolution Church, some 2,000 years later, we are blessed because we have this account. We have truth. Just because it's on the internet, right? Now, because we have this, we can worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. So my claim is that Luke is all about Jesus. That's why we're going to study the, the Gospel of Luke, to lift up Jesus. We're going to know all about Jesus. That's what the book is all about. And we lift up Jesus, he's going to build his church. That's, that's, what, that's what I'd like to see accomplished. That's what I believe is the heart of Jesus Christ the Lord, is to build up his church, because it says it, and that's truth. He said, I'm going to build my church. And if you lift me up, I'll draw people to myself. And so that's what I want to do. I want to just talk about Jesus for the next year. We can talk about a whole lot of different things, but that's all I'm interested in right now is I want to talk about Jesus, and I got a microphone. So, now what's really cool is that the, the claim is that the Gospel of Luke is all about Jesus, right? But yet the first part of it doesn't seem to be about Jesus. So now I kind of look like a liar. But it's really not true. The first part of the, of the Gospel of Luke is about uh, Zechariah <coughs> and John the Baptizer. It's not John the Baptist, okay? He's not a Baptist. He's a Christian, right? He's a guy out in, in, on the Jordan River, out there in the wilderness, baptizing people, saying, hey, Jesus, 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 you got to baptize, you've got to get, get saved, you've got to turn from your sin, right? He's not a Baptist. He's just a, a guy, okay? He's a Christian. But this beginning portion of the book of Luke is about Zechariah, who is John's dad, and Elizabeth, John's mom, but it's mostly about John himself. It's apparently not about Jesus. <clears throat> but it says in the scriptures that John will be great in the eyes of the Lord. So here we are, we're, 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 we're building up John, and we're praising John, and, and I get that, we're honoring this guy. But, but, but why? Why is the scripture doing that? Why does it say he is, he is great in the eyes of the Lord? Well, the, the text will tell us. The, the Bible tells us that he does three things, this John. Let me share those with you. First, it says that he will turn many to the Lord. 
And then it says he will be a prophet much like Elijah, a mouthpiece. He will, he will turn people to the Lord and he will speak to people for the Lord. And then he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. That's what John the baptizer did. This John who was great in the eyes of the Lord. Why was he great in the eyes of the Lord? Because all he is is a person who points people to Jesus Christ. That's why he's awesome. That's why he's incredible. He points people to Jesus. And as we'll see later on in our study of the Gospel of Luke, we'll see that as John begins his earthly ministry here, that he, uh, of turning people to the Lord and speaking for the Lord and preparing the way for the Lord, he does, does this with incredible, incredible humility. He said in John 3.30 that Jesus, th now this is John, the one the Bible says the greatest guy ever. Great in the eyes of the Lord, the greatest man, not God man, but greatest man ever. And, and, and John says, I, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. I must decrease. In Luke 3.16, God loves 3.16s. He says, I will baptize you in water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I, so much greater than I am, that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and to untie the straps of his sandals. Do you know how disgusting it is to unstrap the sandals of people who walk through desert all day and night? They didn't have cars. They didn't have socks. They didn't have nice clothes. They didn't have air conditioning. They had disgusting feet. And the lowest of low slaves were the ones who would be at the door to take off your shoes when you came in. And they weren't all nicely done. They were disgusting. And John's saying, yeah, I'm the greatest guy ever. I am awesome in the Lord's sight, but I am so much less than Jesus Christ, that I'm not even worthy to unstrap the sandals of his dirty, disgusting feet. That's humility. Jesus Christ is greater than the greatest man who ever lived. Now we need to see how Jesus is magnified and exalted in the life and legend of John the baptizer. So are you ready for some truth? Okay. Now, I'm going to be all over the place, but we're going to, our foundation is here in Luke. Here's the truth about Jesus Christ. And, and the first thing, it's going to take a little, a moment to, to get there, but I, we're going to get there. Um, you see that in, in chapter 1, verse 11, that Zechariah, John's dad, is visited by an angel of the Lord. Can you bring up that next picture, Rome? <laughs> you know what that is? Some of you might have one. I don't know. A little guardian angel that's dangling from someone's rearview mirror. Did you ever see one of those things? Don't admit that you have one. I'm about to rip that thing to shreds. <laughs> Maybe you had one in your visor. Maybe you have one on the dashboard. I don't know. Okay, that's not an angel. See, we're supposed to be worshiping God in, in truth, right? So this is just some truth. I'm in favor of truth. I love truth. That's my favorite thing is truth. If I'm going to put my emotions to something, I need to know what it is. I'm not going to do it to something phony. Okay? Look at verse 12 of chapter 1 of, of, of Luke. 11, Zechariah is in the sanctuary and the angel of the Lord appears, right? In verse 12, Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. Don't be afraid. Shake. Shaking and overwhelmed. Did you ever be scared like that? The guys won't admit it, but I will. I've never been so scared in my life. About four years ago, some of you folks in the congregation of Sweet, you, you, you put some money together and you sent Meredith and I on our honeymoon to L.E.J., <clears throat> so we're in this beautiful cabin that y'all took care of for us. I appreciate that. It was beautiful. I'd like to go back. Hint, hint, hint. No, I'm just kidding. And uh, so this, this, this cabin's built on the side of a mountain, right? And you know, these cabins, they got these stilts. And so the mountain's kind of going up like this. And this, this, this cabin's just hanging off, and it's on stilts, right? 
Well, I live in Florida. We, we live in Florida, right? I mean, it storms every day. Nasty storms, right? My house got struck by lightning the other day. It's crazy, right? But it, we see it all the time. It's crazy. So you'd think we'd be used to it, right? So we're in that, we're in that stinking cabin, and I'm watching as the clouds come towards this mountain, and lightning's popping everywhere, and I was not the man of the house anymore. My wife was the man of the house because I was a whimpering, scared baby. I'm like, we're going to die. This is the night we're going to die. I'm glad I'm saved because this is the night I'm going to, to Jesus. I'm done. Like, it was as black as, as this, this podium and the lightning's crack. And you could, because you're way up and there's nothing around you. You're just like a ski jumper like this, hanging off the edge. And this storm, hell's coming at you, right? And I was so scared to death. We had no internet. I got no phone service. We're going to die right here. We're going tumbling off this. I was scared to death. Shaken and overwhelmed. I was scared to death. That's the kind of scared you should be when the angel of the Lord shows up. Not this little wimpy, pathetic thing on your mirror. In Luke chapter uh, 2, verses 8 and 9, you all know this story. It's Christmas, right? The shepherds are out there in the field. They're doing their shepherd thing. They're hanging out singing shepherd songs, right? And, 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 and all of a sudden, what happens in, in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. They were doing their shepherd thing. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. That's an angel of the Lord. You want some more? How about Isaiah chapter 6? I, like no one's ever seen the Lord and lived. You cannot see the fullness of God the Father and live, the Bible says. He's a consuming fire. But, but somehow Isaiah was, was taken to a place and I, I, I can't, the nuts and bolts of it and, the, and, and the, the algebraic equation of it, I can't tell you what it is. But somehow he saw the Lord. It says it was a, it, chapter 6 of Isaiah, right at the beginning, it was the year, in the year King Uzziah died, that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, that's angels, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, right? This is holy ground. And with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations. And the entire building was filled with smoke. You ain't hanging one of those in your rearview mirror, dude. <laughs> Ever. These are scary, mighty, heavenly messengers and soldiers in the battle against the dark forces of hell. And Jehovah's Witnesses believe, it's a very popular belief system in our world, they believe that Jesus Christ is an angel, that he's the archangel Michael. That's their belief. But the Bible tells us otherwise. In Colossians chapter 1, it tells us, it, sh it sheds some light on who Jesus really is. The claim is that he's an angel. But in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. That he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, Jesus Christ, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He created everything in the heavenly realms. Jesus Christ is not an angel. Jesus Christ created the angels. He's not one of them. He's not equal to them. He is Jesus Christ the Lord, and He is supreme over all creation. Colossians 3.19 goes on to say that God in all His fullness was pleased to dwell 
in Christ. As Jesus Christ walked this earth on dirt, just like we do, in that time, he was not lessened or diminished in any way. He was 100% the power of God. God himself, all of God, was in the person of Jesus Christ as he was here. The totality of God was and is in Jesus Christ the Lord. God's position, God's power, his authority, his character, his attitude, his mission, his personality. Jesus Christ is God in skin. That's the truth. And so we cannot disgrace Jesus Christ by calling him an angel or saying that he is equal to them in some way. God's final word on this, and this should close the book on this forever, is in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, where it says that when God sent His Son down here to this earth, He ordered all of His angels to worship Him. Worship my Son. The Lord God is one, right? So why would God, the one God, the Father God, tell his angels to worship another if that other was not God himself. He is God. He is God. He is not an angel. That's truth. Now remember I told you that God is spirit, so we must worship him in spirit and in truth, right? Well, here's some more truth about the spirit. We need this. We need this truth about the spirit because Proper worship stems from proper understanding, right? And there's some prevalent teaching that is false. And I made a promise when I first started this church, and I've made it several times since then, and I'll say it again, that any time I read the Bible and I come across something that jumps out and I go, wait a minute, that's not what Christians believe, but this is what it says, I'm going to confront that. And I'm going to find out the truth because I'm not just going to listen to somebody's hearsay just because it's popular, just because everybody teaches it, just because everybody wants their seats full. I'm not going to do that. Okay, so, so, so here it is. Now, in Ephesians 1.13, you all know this by heart because we went over it for a long time, right? That when, when do you get the Holy Spirit? When does the Holy Spirit take up residence inside of you? Anyone? When you believed, right? Ephesians 1.13. When you believed, at that moment that you bent the knee to Jesus Christ and said, I am yours, you're mine, I can't do this anymore without you, and you say he is your Lord, at that moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of you. But that's not enough. That's the beginning. That's good, right? That's good. But that's not all God wants for you. He doesn't want to just be tucked away in here somewhere. He wants to what? He wants to fill you. He wants to take over so that he can live his life out through your body. That's his goal. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, don't just be settling for the Holy Spirit being in you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants. Well, the Bible teaches us that after Jesus' death, burial and bodily resurrection came the ascension, right? Where, where he returns back to heaven to, to, to get back on his throne that he had left for a time to come on his rescue mission for you to seek and save that which was lost. And he goes back to heaven. And the Bible says, Jesus says himself in John 16, 7, that when I return home, I, it's good for me to go because when I go, I'm going to send that Holy Spirit back to you so now he can live inside of you. That's what he says, right? So what I've heard for much of my Christian life is that people prior to the ascension, prior to the day Jesus finishes the cross, goes to the tomb, resurrects, hangs out with his guys for 40 days, and then he takes off to heaven. That prior to that moment in history, I'm talking all the way back from Adam and Eve, all the way through the Old Testament, and all the way into the New Testament, prior to that day that only people had the Holy Spirit come upon them, like you said. That, that the Holy Spirit would, would come upon someone and, and give them a momentary empowerment to do something that they wouldn't normally do. Have you ever heard that? It's not true. It's not true at all. 
I'm going to let you see that. Go back to Luke. We're just learning some truth here. That's all we're doing. Looking at the Bible, getting some truth. Look at John. I mean, look at Luke chapter 1, verse 15. John the baptizer. Zachariah is told by the angel, you, you and your wife are going to have a kid. I know you're old, but you're going to have a kid. And what does it say right there? Before... That this John will be, not, he won't just have the Holy Spirit in him, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from before he's even born. Jesus hadn't even been born in the flesh yet, and this guy was going to have the, he was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born, before Jesus was born, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't end there. Look at chapter 1, verse 41. You remember this part? When, when Mary, she's pregnant, she's got Jesus inside of her, right? That's pretty awesome. That's a rocking mom, right? And, 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 and so she goes to visit Elizabeth, which has got John inside of her. And when she goes there, the, this John, he leaps. He's so excited about Jesus. He leaps in the womb. Did you ever hear that story before? Or did I make a complete fool of myself for no reason? Okay, but what happens? At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's crazy. I never knew this. I read this so many times, I never saw it. It's crazy, but it doesn't stop there. His dad is Zechariah, right? So Zechariah, verse 67, Jesus hadn't been born yet. No miracles. No cross, no burial, no, no nothing. Verse 67, come on, man, what's it say? Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. Crazy. I never knew it. I've been taught wrong. How can I worship a God I don't know? This is truth. This is truth. Listen, I don't even understand that. It makes no sense to me. I don't understand why they, were, why they had the Holy Spirit in them, but, but we didn't beforehand. Like, I don't get that. I don't understand why that happened. I don't fully understand why the dead in Christ will sleep until he returns. Yet Moses, Elijah, and Enoch will not. Why? Because God said so. It's just what he wants. I don't fully understand why God provides for the just and the unjust. Makes me mad sometimes. Right, Andy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't understand why this Bible has the book of Job in it. I wouldn't put it in there if I was writing one. I don't understand why God loves me. I don't understand why God would, in the person of Jesus, go to a cross to willfully die for people who are spitting at him and slapping him. I don't understand any of that. But I do understand Paul. When in Romans 11, 33 and 34, he's the same as I am right now, and probably most of you in this room, when he says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge, how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. I'm going to read you something. I told you A.W. Tozer is one of my favorites. He said this, When the Holy Spirit comes and opens heaven, until people stand astonished at what they see and in astonished wonderment confess his uncreated loveliness in the presence of that most ancient mystery, then you have worship. If it is not mysterious, there can be no worship. If I can understand God, then I cannot worship God. I will never get on my knees and say, holy, 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 to that which I can figure out. That which I can explain will never overawe me, never fill me with astonishment, wonder, or admiration. God is mysterious. And I think we've lost a little bit of the 
the, the awe of this God. We, we try to figure him out and, and put him inside some equation and some system, some, some systematic theology that if this is right, well, then this has to be right. He's God. Your brain's a pineapple. My brain is a grapefruit. He is God. He is God. There has to be awe. There has to be wonder. There has to be mystery. The Bible even says that the secret things are the Lord's. He is greater than any man. He is greater than any angel, this Jesus. He is mysterious. He is powerful. He is awesome. And he is far above anything else in all of the universe is Jesus Christ the Lord, who stands supreme over all creation. And to, to, to steal a, a line from a video many of you may know, do you know him tonight? Do you know Jesus Christ the Lord? Do you know him? I'm going to ask the band to come up and please lead us in worship one more time. Do you know Jesus Christ the Lord? Do you know him personally? Do you know him on your own research, on your own searching? Do you know him because someone told you about him? Or do you know him because you know him? Because he invaded your life. Maybe he invaded your life right here tonight. Maybe you'd never bowed your knee to the Holy One, the, 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 the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God who went to the cross to pay for your sin so that you and through his death, might have life eternal. There's, there's people in this room here tonight that I don't know. I've never met you before. And this may be my only chance. And so I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. And to hear that stat, that 70,000 plus people every single day in these unknown tribes and nations die every day to a Christless eternity because we haven't told them, that crushes me. That crushes me. I was one of them, and he saved me. And so I'm pleading with you. If I don't know you, I'm pleading with you. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Give your life to Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean you have to start dressing fancy. It doesn't mean you have to start putting money in an offering plate. It doesn't mean you have to come here every week. We'd love for you to come. We'd love to introduce you more to Jesus and let you know him more and, and get to know us more so you can know how great he is and how, how crazy we are. But, but, but give your life to Christ. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you're saved or not. Maybe I'm preaching to the choir. I hope that I am, but if I'm not, now's the, now's the time. And, and here's the thing that's awesome about Jesus is that, remember I said that just because it's on the internet, it's not true, and just because it's hearsay and speculation and all that, who knows about all that stuff? So I don't know what people have told you about becoming a Christian and, and these standards and, and requirements that people put on you so you can become a Christian. But here's the truth, because we, we want to worship in truth, right? The truth is this, that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. That you don't have to be awesome and perfect and have the whole thing memorized just like those old religious guys did. That doesn't mean anything. He died for you while you were filthy, rotten, and terrible in every which way. If you're immersed in the sewer of sin right now, if, if you walked in here with a, with a heroin needle in your arm, Christ still died for you already before you did that. And he still loves you now. So you don't have to be right before you say yes. You say yes, and then he'll make you right. The other thing is, it doesn't take anything special and crazy. The Bible, the truth, just says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is now your Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. And then we go from there. We'll help you. We'll teach you. Teach you all about Jesus. And so if, if that's you, if, if you have never said yes to Jesus, it's, it's that simple. It honestly is. And I'm going to pray right now and I'm going to ask that everybody in this room, if you're a Christian, I want you to pray with me right now. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray for the possibility of, of the person here that may have not said yes yet. 
Because if that's you, you're loved. You are loved by God. You are loved by God. You are loved by me. You are loved by everyone in this room who's a Christian who calls this church home. You are loved, loved, loved. And we want you to live with us forever in heaven. We don't want to do this without you. And this might be our only chance right here, right now. God gave us this opportunity. So Father, I just thank you for tonight. I thank you for the message. I thank you for truth. I thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, your perfect son, who came on a rescue mission for all of us, no matter who we are. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, your love is immeasurable. Perfect, never-ending, consistent, and unconditional love. Lord, I thank you for your Son. I also thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring people to Jesus right now. Perhaps you've wondered about Jesus most of your life, but you've never really known him. You've been scared to give your life over to him because you don't want to lose control. I speak for a lot of people in this room that giving up control is so awesome. It's liberating. It's freedom. I'm a terrible God, but He is a good one. I'm happy to give my life to Christ, and I welcome anyone right now in this room who's never said yes to Jesus to just do what the Bible says, simple. Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm no longer the Lord of my life. Jesus, you're my Lord. And I believe, Father, that you raised your son Jesus from the dead so that I might have life. And so I accept what Jesus has done on the cross as my payment for my sin so I can have life. If you said something like that just now to God, he heard you. And if that's you, I would really like to talk to you when we get done here in just a few moments. Please let me know. We've been called to worship God in spirit and in truth. We're supposed to release our emotions, our God-given emotions, to the Lord. And I don't want to conjure anything up, but I can tell you earlier, honestly, as your pastor and I love you, we needed a little fire in this room. And so now you've heard truth. Would you give your emotions over to the truth you just heard and worship the Lord with your emotions? Whatever it is that's inside of you, I can tell you that in this church, unlike many others, you can worship Him the way you want. If you want to shout and tell Him, I love you, Jesus, you can do it. If you want to get down on the ground and bow before him, you can do that. If you're crying, don't hide it. If you want to pray with someone, let's pray. Whatever, you, whatever emotion comes flying out of you, don't, 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 don't governor it. Don't, don't, don't block it. Just let it out. So you've heard some truth tonight, right? Amen. Now, based on that truth, worship him in spirit. Amen? Amen. I love you guys.